Welcome back. Today we're looking at the motion of a spinning top, which is a great example of angular momentum and 3D motion for a dynamic system. Here the top is spinning around along one axis, but then it's also precessing, and then there's also a nutation. So the spinning is, is how fast the top spins, like this rotation here, and then the nutation is this, ang this bobbing back and forth angle and the precession is the motion of the whole top of the whole system moving around along this axis here. So today we're looking at the spinning top equations of motion. An important thing to remember with 3D motion is that omega and alpha are vectors that describe rotation. So the angular rotation and the angular velocity. Whenever we have a planar system, that means the, the object is fixed to move in a 2D plane. We only have one vector representing rotation, just whatever that theta dot is, the angle of the part. And then alpha, the angular acceleration, would be omega dot, or this theta double dot in that k direction. So it's always rotating in or out of the plane. When we look at a 3D system, now we have omega with three components, the same way that we have um, three components that make up a velocity vector. An angular velocity vector is a rotation, so it's got three components there, and then its derivative is going to have three components as well. When we look at the kinetic energy of a system, there are actually three parts in general. One half mv dot v, so whatever point we're talking, this vb dot vb, whatever point we're talking about, one half mass of the system, mass of the system times vb times dotted with the velocity of g with respect to b. So this is the relative velocity of the center of mass to the point b. And then the last term that we've looked at a little bit before is this one half omega dotted with i omega which is the angular momentum of the system. So omega dotted with that angular momentum, that's the uh, kinetic energy due to rotation in the system. This middle term here, VB dot VGB, this is zero if the position of B is equal to the position of G. So if it's rotating, if you're talking about rotating around its center of mass, or if you take VB as zero. The angular momentum of a system, so if you're looking at HB, then what, what we said is that it's equal to I times omega, but the reason we can say that is that it's actually a triple integral over the volume of this system. So here if we have our classic potato, and we want to calculate what the angular momentum about some point B within that potato, then we have to take the cross product of all of the parts of this, of this potato crossed with omega cross IB to try to get the velocity, the position crossed with the velocity in there, and times that density with dx, dy, and dz. And if I take this integral, what I find is that HB is going to be the sum of all these different terms, this y squared and z squared, x y, minus xy, omega y, minus xz, omega z, i, and all these other nine terms that make this up. But I can pull out the omega x, y, and z and turn this into that matrix i, my inertia matrix. And this inertia matrix is really representing this kind of the sum of square difference between where the how the mass is located around the rotation point, around that point of rotation. So I have all these xx, yy, and zz, those are the moments of inertia. And then these xy, xz, and yz, these negative terms, those are called the products of inertia. And those are where you get the x, y, and y, z terms. Most of the time when you're looking at um, a table of in, like these triple integrals, like for a sphere or a rod, 
it's looking at the principal axes of this rotation. So just the IXX, IYY, and IZZ. So we have this inertia matrix, IXX, IYY, and IZZ. If we look it up, and that's the result of this triple integral of uh, over the volume of a point. If I want to change the point of rotation to some other point B, I can use this parallel axis theorem where the angular moment that the inertia matrix around B is going to be the inertia matrix around G plus M times this integral, times this integral, which is this y squared plus z squared, x squared plus z squared, x squared plus y squared, and then all these extra products of inertia. Coming back to our spinning top example, we have three components of angular velocity, this omega x, omega y, omega z. Omega x is going to be this theta dot, so that's going to describe nutation in our system, the change in the nutation angle. Omega y is this phi dot times sine theta, so it's a precession, so it's the angular velocity due to precession just along that sine component. And then omega z is this cosine component of the precession angle plus that psi dot. So we're looking at this uh, system that's located around the, the uh, top itself and it's rotating at a rate of phi of the phi dot. And what I want to do is put the point of rotation, find that the moment of inertia, this inertia matrix around the origin rather than the center of mass of our spinning top. So I, the spinning top itself will have some ix and iy that are equal and then an iz which is the resistance to spinning motion and then plus this m times my parallel axis theorem so the final result is that i have i is i i plus md squared plus i plus md squared plus iz where d is that distance to the center of mass now that i have my inertia matrix that i term h is going to be the sum of this i x i y i z times omega y omega x y and z and the kinetic energy is just one half omega dotted with that h o times omega so total kinetic energy is here then the next step for our lagrangian equations is choosing our generalized coordinate system so general uh, sorry generalized coordinates so I'll use phi, psi, and theta, my precession angle, my spin angle, so how much it's spun already, and my nutation angle, so how much it's rotated off of that vertical axis. Then my potential energy in this system is due to gravity. The system wants to hang vertically down, but because it has this angular momentum, it can actually keep itself upright or at least like pre at a constant angle and precess around the, the vertical axis. So my um, potential energy is this MGD times cosine theta. And if I take the partial of L with respect to theta dot, phi dot, and psi dot, then I get these three parts of the equation. DL D theta is going to give the main, so dl d theta dot and dl d theta will give my second order differential equation of motion. But dl d phi and dl d psi, these are both equal to zero. So dl d phi dot and dl d psi dot, these are constants that because they're, when I plug that into the Lagrangian equation of motion, it's an exact integral so the, it's just determined based on the initial phi dot, theta, and psi dot. So now I'm left with three equations. One is a second order differential equation with this I, O, theta, double dot. 
minus that phi dot squared and then these other terms with that mgd sine theta being the uh, minus mgd sine theta that's that uh, force due to gravity term and then I have these other two equations that relate phi dot and psi dot based on the initial uh, angle and the initial spin and the initial uh, precession rate so I've got two equations to solve for phi dot and psi dot, two first order equations, and then one second order equation to determine theta double dot. With these three equations, I have three unknowns because uh, I have three generalized coordinates. So I do have three differential equations. Two of them are first order, but I can look at just this second order differential equation with theta double dot. And let's take the an extreme case where the spin, the rate of spin, psi dot, is way bigger than phi dot and theta dot. So it's spinning much faster than it's precessing and much faster than theta dot. So when that's the case, this phi dot squared goes to zero. The phi dot times psi dot term, that one stays because psi dot is really big. And then this MGD sine theta, that stays, but the theta double dot uh, goes to zero compared to that psi dot term. Then I end up with this equation that phi dot times psi dot iz sine theta is equal to negative that MGD sine theta. And this gives me a relation between the precession angle and the rate of spin for high spin rates that the, pr that the precession rate will be equal to one over that spin rate. This is a cool result for fast spinning tops where the precession rate is directly related to the rate of spin.